Well, hello for all of you who are in isolation like myself, in quarantine like myself. Uh, for me, it, it, it's, it's not been a great uh, difficulty because this allows me to not travel. I can stay home in my office in, you might say, academic isolation. And so therefore, it gives me much more time to do research uh, on the coins and also on 7th century claims to Islam, a whole new area that I'll be introducing in just a bit. But in the last week and two, I've been putting up some videos that have already gone up on Syria International, where Al-Fadi and I have been discussing this debate between King and Gibson concerning the Qibla and the directions of the Qibla. And the last one I just put up yesterday, and, and King thinks that the earlier constructors of the mosque didn't know their mathematics very well, and that's why they made all these mistakes. Gibson comes back with that, and you can with the graph that we put up there says very clearly that the earlier Qiblas, those that are directed towards, certainly towards Petra, were much more accurate. Up until 706, much more accurate than those that were directed towards Mecca much later, after 727. And so this question comes up, where does King get this from? Now, there have been a number of you who have responded to this, but there's one in particular. I don't know how you pronounce his name, Gazon Nick, Nicky, or N-I-K-Q-I. This is his response, and I'm assuming he's a Muslim because he's responding like a Muslim, and he says this. Whether it is astrology, or astronomy, or actual maths, what actually matters is that Muslims eventually figured it out and when they did, that's when newly built mosques faced closer to the right way. In the 14th century, Damascus, the mathematical problem of finding the Qibla for the whole Muslim world, was solved for all time with the splendid table of Al-Khalili, giving accurate values to degrees and minutes for each degree of latitude and each degree of longitude, difference from the meridian of Mecca. I have described Al-Khalili's table as the most sophisticated trigonomic, trigonometric table known to me from the entire medieval period. In the 15th century, Samarkand, a table was compiled with entries for each of 275 localities from Al-Andalus to China, giving longitudes and latitudes as well as accurately computed Qibla directions and distances to Mecca. From the 17th century, Isfahan, we have three world maps centered on Mecca, so devised that one can read off the Qibla accurately for any locality in the Muslim world. The underlying cartographical theory was developed several centuries earlier. These are all highly impressive by medieval standards. What people did with this information is another matter. And then he asks uh, this question. Do you know how accurate they were in 6 to 700 compared to the text above? Any scientific articles which describe the longitude and latitude position with data from 6 to 780 compared to that of 727 to 1400. How accurate they were? Well, I'm not sure if he, if he watched the video itself because in these series of videos we're talking about the accuracy and uh, in fact the video before we asked that very question. When you look at the accuracy, uh, and I just mentioned that at the beginning of this episode, when you look at the accuracy of the earliest Qiblas, they are all earlier than any of those that come later except for the in-between, the Wasit, they're known as Wasit in Arabic, those in-between mosques uh, that begin to appear in 706. But up to 706, the 20 that, that uh, Gibson has uh, noted, from they're all facing Petra. Those 20, if you add them all together, the median comes to about 2.9% uh, off, uh, off their trajectory. If you take away the, the two worst and look at the 18 of them, it's less. So that's how accurate they are. Now, when you look at the in-between mosques, there's uh, oh, about 10 of them. They are accurate within 1%. That's how accurate. So they're the most accurate. When you look at the parallel mosques, there's only six of them. 
they're about 3%. But when you look and you go to the Meccan mosques, which are the latest mosques, which don't even begin to appear until 727. So all of them that come after 727, when you look at their accuracy, they are 4.78 degrees off. Double, which are uh, uh, incorrect compared to the Petran mosques. And that's why we're asking, why is it the king thinks that they're dumb? Why is it the king thinks that these earliest uh, Qibla directions are the worst? When he obviously didn't either didn't read Gibson's book, or maybe he was just not aware of just how accurate these earliest Qibla's are. But then I can understand, since he never went to and did any of the work, did any of the legwork. But Gazan, Nick, uh, Nick, however you pronounce your name, can you then see why actually it's the earliest ones that are the most accurate? That's why we're even asking the question. That's why we're bringing it up. But I'm going to pull out some other things that you brought up here because you go on to say some other things. And you finally say that by the 14th century, the 14th century, so you're talking about 700 years later, finally they get it right. Six to 700 years later, they finally get it right. <laughs> That's an awful like time. And what I want to ask is why does it take them to six to 700 years to finally get the directions right when the earliest mosques all had it right? What went wrong? And why is it they lost that ability in the previous six to 700 years? Now, let's go on. You quote something that it's fascinating. Here's your quote, the most sophisticated Trigonometric table known to me from the entire medieval period is this, and you're talking about El Khalili. Khalili's uh, trigonometry is the most sophisticated trigonometry table known to me from the entire medieval period. And I said, wait a minute, I've heard that quote before. You're not quoting that, Nikki. You're actually getting it from another scholar who actually said much the same thing. He said the most sophisticated astronomical instrument, referring to the astrolobe, from the entire medieval period. So he's saying the exact same thing you are. This is the most sophisticated astrolobe, astronomical instrument from the entire medieval period. Who do you think said that? Well, that was Dr. David King. You're actually quoting Dr. David King, who wrote that in 1981 in an article, The Origin of the Astrolobe, According to the Medieval Islamic Science, in the Journal for the History of Arabic Science, uh, volume 5, pages 43 to 83. Now, what's fascinating to me is King wrote that in 1981. I, I don't know why he even he was going on about how great the astrolabe was and how that this fellow, Al-Khalili, was the one that was the... the well, he actually wasn't just Al-Khalili. It was also uh, Karizmi, who also was strong. But he goes on and he talks about how great it was. This was the most sophisticated instrument from this entire period, medieval period. And I think that is where you need to be careful. It's the entire medieval period. If you just take that little, the medieval period was from the 8th century up until 1300. So from, uh, from the 8th century, so we're talking about 700s up to 1300 is the medieval period. If that's the if you're going to just use that period, it was the most sophisticated in that period. But there were many others before that who knew about astrolabs. I just went up in line to, to see uh, where they are and where the astrolab itself was first invented, way back in 220 to 150 BC by Hipparchus in Greece. Theon of Alexandria wrote a detailed treatise on the astrolabe. In 550, the Christian philosopher John Philoponus also did a treaty treatise on the astrolabe, and he wrote that in Greek. The bishop Severus Sebot uh, wrote a treatise on the astrolabe in the Syriac language in the mid-7th century, so that's a whole another hundred years before the Arabs even got into bo on board on this. So to say that this is the most sophisticated astronomical instrument uh, from this entire per period, I would suggest possibly that is true from just the medieval period, but you're not taking into consideration where they got the idea from. They didn't invent the idea. Uh, they just got the idea. They borrowed it from the Greeks and the Europeans before them. In fact, it was only in the 8th century that finally the first Arab mathematician, Muhammad al-Fazari, I think I said it right, finally took the astrolab, and he is really known as the one from the, from the Arab world that actually, in the 8th century, uh, used it primarily to schedule prayer times and also to find the Qibla. It's fascinating, though, when you get these kind of answers uh, that these great, amazing Arab, Muslim mathematicians, King talks about it. In fact, everybody seems to come back to this, that the best and the brightest, the, 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 the superlative references. It reminds me 
of another man named Khalili. In fact, in, in 2016, Jim Al Khalili, uh, when I was in Britain, he, uh, just before I left Britain, he had done this documentary for BBC where he goes through all the science, uh, Islamic science, and shows how it was the foundation for all the science that came later. Claim after claim after claim that algebra was invented by Muslims, that that uh, the, alkali, uh, the al alkaline or alkali was the basis for chemistry, uh, and that algorithms were created by <laughs> Muslims, and that was the foundation for computers. All these claims, in fact, let me just give you a quote that he gave that says much the same thing. There would be no modern mathematics or physics without algebra, which he claims came from Islam. No computers without algorithms, which he believes, again, were introduced by Islam. And no chemistry without alkalis, which, again, he believes is the basis for chemistry, which it was the Muslims who discovered it. I remember back, back in 2016, we went uh, to this gallery that was put up there at the uh, muse science museum in london and we went through every one of these took notes on them, and then we went back and studied and we found that in every case the arabs or in this case muslims by this time had nothing to do with any of this material they were not the ones that invented it at all they were the, usually the ones that took it from the Greeks, from the Babylonians, and usually from the Greek text, and they translated it, put it into Arabic, and then gave an Arabic name to it. And the Arabic name is one is a name that sticks today. That's why they're called the father of algebra. Let's take algebra. Al uh, Khwarizmi is another is one person that's always quoted as being the father of algebra. He was the one that they claimed established the mathematical tradition, which we now know as algebra today. That's why he's called the father of algebra. And uh, Jim Al-Khalili talks about this in 2016. Yet, when you go and you read what he actually did, all he did is he translated and formalized and commented on ancient Indian and Greek words. He didn't actually invent any of it. He didn't discover any of it. He took and he borrowed from the Indians and he borrowed from the Greeks. And then he used and gave the name Al-Jibr uh, from Algebra. And so that stuck. We're not even sure if al Khwarizmi was even a Muslim. It looks like, according to the latest studies, that he was a Zoroastrian, but he was forced to convert to Islam, as was quite normal back then. Now, the roots of algebra date way back to the ancient Babylonians and were then developed in Egypt and then went on to Greece in the 4th and 3rd century BC. And it was the Alexandrian Greek mathematicians like Diophanes in the 3rd century who is not really is one that is referred to as the father of algebra because he was the one that actually wrote about it and explained it long before Khwarizmi, who then made it popular and then gave the word and took the word and actually it's the word that stuck that has now been claimed falsely as the father of algebra. Others also knew about algebra long before the Arabs. The Chinese knew about it, and especially the Indians. Brahmagupta is the man that was writing about algebra long before the Muslims were writing about it. So this idea that they invented algebra and that we have to give them credit, when you look at the historical record, that's not the case. Let's look at algorithms. I wanted to find out about algorithms. Algorithms actually were well known in 2500 BC in the Babylonian era. They were then referred to and talked about in 1550 BC by the Egyptians. In 300 BC, Eratosthenes and also Euclidean referred to and, re to, uh, and also wrote about it. It's fascinating because the only reason we know about Eratosthenes and also Euclides, Euclides and also what he wrote, they wrote on algorithm comes from the Muslims, comes from al Khwarizmi, who translated their works. Can you then understand why by translating the work of the Greeks, they then became, the, the, uh, they be, then took on the mantle today by modern scholars, especially Muslim scholars, who believe that therefore they are the ones who should be credited with this. al Khwarizmi was only heard about it and only referred to it and wrote about it in the late, in the mid uh, ninth century, around 850 before he died. He is one that coined the name, and he coined the name using a Latin word called algorithmi. Algorithmi he then made into algorithm, 
And that's why it became an Arabized word taken from the Latin. So he is not even the one who really should be given credit for this. What's more, algorithms as far as a basis for a computer was not done by the Muslims at all. It was done primarily by Europeans, Germans, names like Gödel and Herbrand and Church, Post, Post and Turing. They're the ones who actually took the algorithms and did something with it so that we have computing today. That's all done by Europeans, not by Arabs and certainly not by Muslims. As far as alkali, I wanted to find about alkali and I, I looked everywhere and I couldn't find any idea where he got this idea that chemistry is, is based on alkali and without alkali you cannot have chemistry. I couldn't find anywhere. However, I came across this quote, an alkaline solution is known as a basic in chemistry and I think maybe that's where this um, Khalili and Muslims have gotten confused. They've taken that phrase and they think it's the basis of chemicals. No, it's a basis within chemical. It's known as a basic in within chemical because it dissolves in water, a salt solution. And that's why you can uh, see it. It's one of the few that is dissolvable. It's like a potash uh, salt. Now, my fifth question, and this is where I want to end with. Nikki, I, I have no problem with you suggesting that the Arabs were very good with mathematics and algebra, and so they're very good with algorithms and all the rest. And I hear this over and over again repeated by so many Muslims. I don't, I don't want to sit there and, and bandy around whether or not who, uh, whether or not they did, and they actually actually helped out because certainly once the Greeks and the Babylonians and the Romans who had given and were the basis for a lot of these ideas, the Indians and the Chinese as well, in the medieval period Europe was going through a very uh, closed down. There was not hardly any discoveries that were going on in that period. And so it stands to read the medieval period, about the 8th, to the, uh, 8th century to the, uh, the 14th century, 1300s, uh, I would suggest that certainly uh, the Arabs who were expanding and moving out and, and conquering, and many of the peoples they were conquering were people that had already many of these abilities with them, and they were bringing them into the Islamic fold. So it stands to reason that there would be great names there. But here's my question. What happened after the medieval period? What happened after the 14th and 15th century? Where did Islam go from there? And what has happened since? Today, in the 20th century, where are these great scholars coming out of the Muslim world today? Show me them. Where are these Nobel laureates that you hear? The Nobel Prize, how many of them are, are Arabs and how many of them are in the sciences or in chemistry or in mathematics? Can you name them to me? I can't. And it seems to me that while there was a flourishing of possibly, and a lot of it has not to do with that they were inventing it or creating it, they were taking it as Islam always does, it borrows everything like this, we've talked about the scriptures, they were taking it and they were then translating it, giving names to it, applying it like on the astrolabe or, but after that period, after the 1300s, there seems to be a diminution. And today, I look around the world and I ask, where are the great Muslim scholars today? Where are they at the forefront in chemistry or mathematics or biology or physics or in any area? Outside of politics, they're not really there. Politics, they are at the forefront because they are so much in de demand in politics because, because they are the ones who are driving it and they're causing a lot of the problems in that area but I don't see great schools of science or great schools of mathematics or physics in the Arab world today, in the Muslim world today. And if you're going to claim that all this has come as a basis, and they did so well in the 14th and 15th century, Nikki, what happened after the 14th and 15th century? What went, to, what went wrong? And why is it almost all the greatest, re, uh, uh, the greatest inventions all are now coming out of Europe and America and Japan and China? Nothing is coming out of the Middle East. Nothing is coming out of the Muslim world. And there are no great schools of knowledge today in anywhere. If you can help me, show me, to explain this to me. Seems to me that Islam does not do well when it is against, up against other viewpoints. There's no really way to conclude this, but, but then just put the question out there, and that's all I can do. Why is it Islam has not kept up their ability to be at the top of the world, to be at the forefront of inventions or creations or scientific discoveries? 
Why have they become right back to the backwaters of the world today? Help me here. Nikki, I appreciate that you answer, but I'd love to know what's going on. And this is why maybe you are, do have people like Dr. Dave King, who's trying to resurrect that golden period, to try to show that there was something great. And he's focusing in just on the Meccan period and trying to say that Meccan period after 727, that that's where it all began. I would suggest that if it is beginning there, why, why don't you recognize what was happening before? Look at the Nabataeans who preceded them, the pre-Islamic Arabs, the Nabataeans, my goodness, they were way ahead of the later Muslims. And that's a question that Muslims need to answer. Well, I leave it over to you. God bless you as we're here in our offices doing our research. It's good to be able to get that discussion out there. This is Jay, over and out. <laughs>